I am now pleased uh, to welcome Curtis Zuniga uh, to join me for a fireside chat on stage. Give Curtis a round of applause as I continue to introduce him. Curtis is a member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians, which is its colonized name, um, and he'll tell you more about that later. And he is the co-director and co-founder of the Lenape Center. Big round of applause for Curtis being able to make it for, uh, with us today. Thank you so much. I love that Curtis has props. I'm going to give him a minute to unpack, and then we'll get started. Curtis, I'm so honored that you could join us. It was really a pleasure to connect with you over the phone. I'm wondering if you can tell us about the important work of the Lenape Center and, and where you are located. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I am Curtis Zuniga. I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. As was mentioned, Delaware, that's our colonizer name. In our language, we are Lenape. And I wanna thank Mauricio for the land acknowledgement acknowledging that this is the original homeland of the Lenape people, our original homeland extended from like the foothills of the Catskills Mountains all the way down to the Delaware Bay. So we're picking up Manhattan, we're picking up all of New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, an important corridor in our history, but also an important corridor in the history of this United States of America. I am, uh, I am a co-director of a very small nonprofit called Lenape Center, which is, uh, was founded 13 years ago here in New York City. And uh, the work that uh, we are doing above all is to let people know that the Lenape still exists, as was brought up, uh, I, believe, I believe, by Michael, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, it's like people still think of us as way in the past that we don't exist anymore. A lot of that has to do with forced removal and forced colonization on our people. From the very first encounters in the early 17th century, here come the Dutch, later the English, and then the Americans but they brought with them to our lands a system of a worldview of control, domination, property, ownership. And that is totally opposite of the worldview of the Lenape people. And the Lenape people, I'm gonna say, we're a microcosm now of indigenous people and and I heard representatives of the Af African American community too. I saw a lot of similarities. So I no sense in going over a lot of what's already been said. I have learned a lot. I'm very humbled to be <laughs> in your midst, folks. Um, but that system of domination, that system of control is the exact opposite of the worldview of Lenape and other indigenous people because here's the way I look at it. I'm going to speak for myself. I'm a Lenape person. I'm a man, Lenape man. And I bring a traditional knowledge that I have sought throughout my lifetime. We don't own the land. We don't have sovereignty over the land. Nature, creation is the sovereign. We are related. We are related to all of creation. Water, soil, earth, sky. All of creation is a living spirit. The mountains even. And it's very important that forced colonization and forced assimilation, some of the things that were done to gain control over us was to remove our culture from who we are, our language, that worldview, because it conflicted with the Eurocentric 
Christian-dominated worldview that changed our homeland, which we call Lenape Hoking. Now, because of that, even our own children are losing that understanding that we are related. These are our relatives. The moon, um, I talked to it in a female orientation. The rivers, the same way. There's this balance of male and female spirit. But it goes all the way down to seeds. Um, I'm, I'm going to get these seeds out here for a minute. <laughs> Please. Um, but bringing ancestral knowledge to my work has to do with being in a diaspora community in Oklahoma, where the Lenape, after being in the original homeland, were forcibly moved out in different directions. We have Lenape communities now in southern Ontario, Canada. Muncie communities in Wisconsin. And also communities in Oklahoma. I've had the good fortune through Lenape Center of returning to the homeland and through a very valuable partnership that we struck with a corporate nonprofit farm they provided land for us. All I had to do was show up with the seeds. I'm so blessed with this uh, partnership with Hudson Valley Farm Hub, about 100 miles north of here, uh, outside of Kingston, New York. And so I came from Oklahoma a couple of years ago and started growing this corn, sesopsing in our language. It's a blue flint corn. It made a long journey. We have records of Dutch merchants writing about the Lenape growing this corn in the very valley where I began growing sesopsing in 2022. Lenape Center, working with a different partner, um, started growing this. I've had my hands in the soil for the last, uh, well, I'll be starting my third season now. As part of our forced removal from these lands, I can tell our story and then you can imagine it, the same model being used around the world even today, where a dominant outside force comes in, annexes the land, runs the indigenous people off, and a lot of the tactics include burning their crops. Our women, in their forced removal from Lenape Hoking all the way out to Oklahoma, oftentimes they would sow seeds into the lining of their clothes to smuggle seeds. Can you imagine smuggling seeds? But we have an obligation, and the obligation is to take the traditional knowledge of our ancestors, to learn it and protect it, to give it a word in our language. And that language is, is so important because it's a, the, the foundation of all things culture is language. They tried to take our language away from us too. But we held on and persevered all throughout that diaspora, that forced removal. But in our Indian ways, we, we view the circle as a very powerful symbol. So here I am, all these years later, come in full circle. These seeds were found at a seed bank at the University of Iowa. 
as we looked around. Then we looked at the history of that and discovered that the seeds were handed down over several generations, regrown and the like, but by one of our own tribal community members in Oklahoma. When she passed away, her seed collection was donated. We found these seeds, brought them back to the homeland. The seeds have a memory. The seeds have a spirit. And when the seeds of the ancestors are, I call it rematriation, rematriated back into Mother Earth, they have a memory that connects deep beneath the soil where the bones of my ancestors lay buried. They have, they have a knowledge. Now, the practical knowledge of seeds of agriculture have been expressed throughout this morning. And again, I am so humbled with this knowledge um, I, don't ha I don't have all that, that scientific knowledge. I'm just trying to learn about our intrinsic knowledge, that which is in our customs, traditions, storytelling, which is a big element here. And all of the culture built around it, what I've been able to do with corn, I'm growing, by the way, I'm, I'm growing. I'm, I'm out there in the field. Uh, these are my nice boots. <laughs> um, I'm growing two varieties of corn. I also have uh, the, the blue corn is a sop sing. This is just a white corn we call puhwem. Three varieties of squash. Um, no, two varieties of squash, three varieties of beans. And yes, that interplanting is also known as the three sisters, right? Corn, beans, and squash. That's a practice that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I'm also growing medicines like sweetgrass and tobacco. Gourds, which I found are really plentiful. Um, sunflowers, these are traditional crops. But by bringing them back to the homeland, planting those seeds in there, I'm going full circle from having a taken away and the people taken away and the land taken away to come back and connect with the land, rematriate these seeds. Another part that's so important, is, especially in sharing with our children and grandchildren, there is culture built all around it through songs, dances, ceremonies, language, all of that. That is the holistic part of what we're doing. That's part of that worldview that we don't own it. We build familial relationships with all of creation by taking our spirit and connecting with the spirit of the soil, the water, the air, and the lessons on how to take care of it. I know time's running out, but here's a takeaway. All tables of power in this nation and around the world, if that power was derived by running the indigenous people off and taking their land, Today, indigenous people need to have a seat at the table of power of all things, and in particular, the environmental policies in our world. And our voice should be allowed in all conversations, in public policy and social discourse. Um, and here's why, and the time is running out, I recognize that, but here, here's something that I'm discovering. as part of that force removal, to see our land taken away, to see our warriors killed, to see our women and children suffering as they went on that, what I call the trail of broken treaties. Mm. Children 
being born into an environment of war and battle and land theft and racism and all of that. It's going on around the world today right now, folks. People learned a lesson of what happened to my people 400 years ago. And therefore, we carry with us a historical trauma that becomes a generational trauma, and it's still carried today in our world. But the Indian problem wasn't fixed. It's still going on. We're still dealing with issues that are the residual effects of forced removal, forced assimilation. And so the work that I do when I get out, when I get up in the morning and I go into the uh, garden, when I go out to the cornfield, when I offer tobacco to the rising sun in prayer, when I put my fingers into the soil and connect with the spirit of the land, opening up my spirit, because I want to give the best that I can to these foods. Make them come up in a good way to be healthy, nutritious, living, spiritual blessings. When I do that, when I'm able to speak my language, when I'm able to stand up, sing a song of thanksgiving for these gifts, when, I ha when I'm able to do all that, that is how I achieve healing and wellness from historical and generational trauma. And, and I, and I want to say that as, as a Lenape, and I think in a lot of indigenous cultures, we give thanks to the knowledge and the sacrifices of the ancestors, and we have an obligation to teach our children and our grandchildren so that circle never closes. Or, I mean, there's, there's never an opening in the circle. It's always going to remain a closed circle that we can just keep going on and on. That's a part of our cultural knowledge. Um, I, oh, honey, I, I know we're about to have lunch, and that, I got to, we, we don't want to forget all of the great foods that come out of what we grow. I've learned how to make a really wonderful uh, blue corn muffins with blueberries. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't bake much, but boy, when I baked them, it was really good. <laughs> uh, a, a blue corn mush with blueberries and, and uh, walnuts and that. It's just, these are the foods that fed the ancestors. This is how we're going to work on overcoming diabetes and other practices. I, there's a lot more I could say, but time has run out. I want to thank you all very much. Thank you to Curtis, and thank you for the work that you are doing to heal the land and people. I am so honored that you could join us today. Thank you so much. Please give him another round of applause.